Monsieur le directeur général de la HSSO Genève, chères étudiantes et chers étudiants, chères collaboratrices et chers collaborateurs, au nom du conseil de direction de la Haute École de Gestion de Genève, j'ai le très grand plaisir de vous accueillir à cette nouvelle conférence de rentrée académique de l'automne 2021. Pour ceux qui ne sauraient pas, je m'appelle Andrea Baranzini et je suis le directeur de l'école et je suis aujourd'hui particulièrement content de pouvoir effectuer cette conférence de rentrée, enfin aussi en présentiel ici dans notre belle Ola, en espérant que la situation sanitaire s'améliorera et que nous pourrons revenir bientôt à la situation normale pour que vous puissiez profiter à nouveau pleinement des échanges qui sont tant enrichissants et qui font partie du parcours de formation et de croissance des étudiantes et des étudiants. Pour cette conférence de rentrée, j'ai l'honneur et le grand plaisir de vous présenter M. Sergio Hermotti. M. Hermotti est actuellement président du groupe Suisserie, une société d'assurance et de réassurance fondée à Zurich en 1863, qui par son chiffre d'affaires est la deuxième société mondiale de réassurance. De 2011 à 2020, M. Hermotti a été directeur général du BS, la plus grande banque suisse et la plus grande banque de gestion de fortune dans le monde. Nous sommes ravis que M. Hermotti ait accepté notre invitation, car nous pensons qu'il puisse représenter une exceptionnelle source d'inspiration pour la communauté de l'HEG Genève. Pour au moins trois raisons. Il y en a un quatrième, c'est qu'il était sinois, mais il y a trois raisons <rire> principales. La première, c'est que d'abord, comme vous le verrez, son parcours incarne le succès du modèle de formation dual qui est particulièrement important pour notre pays et qui est porté aussi par les HES. En fait, M. Hermotti a quitté l'école à 15 ans et voulait devenir professeur de sport. Cependant, après un apprentissage chez une banque au Tessin, il a découvert que sa voie était dans le secteur bancaire. D'apprenti à directeur général de succès d'une des banques plus grandes du monde, quelle réussite pour notre modèle de formation. Ensuite, une bonne partie de nos étudiants et de nos étudiantes seront employés dans le secteur bancaire et financier. Nous sommes d'ailleurs la seule HEG en Suisse romande à offrir un bachelor avec une orientation en banque et finance. Mais nos étudiantes et nos étudiants seront aussi des managers dans des secteurs divers et variés. L'expérience de M. Hermotti dans ce domaine est tout à fait exceptionnelle et nous nous réjouissons d'entendre quelques mots sur son expérience à la tête de grandes institutions financières. Et troisièmement, l'HEG est précurseur et propose aussi des parcours de formation dans le domaine de la durabilité et de la responsabilité sociétale des entreprises. Des formations qui vont du bachelor jusqu'à la formation continue. Dans ce contexte, M. Hermotti est président du groupe Suisserie, dont la durabilité est son modèle d'affaires et dont le directeur général a été lauréat du Green Business CEO 2021, décerné par Bilance. L'intervention de M. Hermotti va durer environ une trentaine de minutes et il répondra ensuite à des questions posées par notre association des étudiants et par notre junior entreprise. Voilà, je nous souhaite désormais un bon moment avec M. Serge Hermotti, à qui je cède la parole. Merci. Merci beaucoup pour être là aujourd'hui parmi nous. Alors, car au professeur Baranzini, cher professeur et étudiant, ladies and gentlemen, your students, so I'm happy to join uh, all of you today for this uh, welcome back at uh, AHG. Uh, in the context of COVID, I guess uh, a welcome back is uh, very good news for all of you. Uh, in the meeting, uh, after so many months uh, zooming in and out, uh, uh, and uh, losing pr potentially also some uh, opportunities for all of you. Uh, I'm, I'm sure this day means uh, a lot. So uh, after a summer of optimism, uh, uh, we see uh, COVID uh, infection rates uh, uh, still uh, uh, rising again. So 
But I'm confident that despite all of this, also thanks to the measures that the governments have been taking, you will be able to enjoy a full year of more in-person education. So, uh, dear students, my intention today is to encourage you in your aspirations on a potentially to give you food for thoughts on how to develop your careers. So and now all of, a, uh, all of a sudden I'm talking about Corona, so you may wonder how inspiring that can be. Uh, well, let me uh, try this. Uh, first of all, I think that we have to put everything in, in the right context. And uh, for sure, if you look at economic data, a quick recovery after the dramatic shock of 2020 shows that uh, globally we are at clear uh, up uh, movements and uh, uh, upswings. And uh, also here in Switzerland, we saw a very strong recovery uh, in, in May, uh, uh, which uh, where we reached all-time uh, highs in terms of uh, economic uh, growth uh, when measured on a monthly basis. And this was also due to the very strong uh, uh, intervention by governments that was not only well designed, but also well executed in stepping in and really giving confidence to uh, uh, both enterprises, but also to uh, all the people working uh, and in the broad economy to um, 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 go through this very difficult time. So uh, I think that's a, a success story and uh, we now uh, see uh, recovery rates that are well beyond even the most optimistic uh, forecast that we saw in 2020 by you know, the consensus of the economists. So, uh, of course, uh, this is not really sustainable in terms of how we grow, and so we are likely to see a more normalized pattern. But in that sense, uh, I would say that for what it means for all of you is pretty good news, because at the very least, you will be able to continue your education, your uh, involvement in the labor market in a situation that will be not far away from the one that you left uh, pre-COVID, so the economic stability. Now, having said that, I always need to put a caveat into, into that kind of statements because, of course, if you look at the macroeconomic uh, conditions and the geopolitical conditions that we had before COVID, they were already fragile. And so the pandemic was just coming on top of it and potentially even accelerating some positive and negative trends that we saw there. So, uh, you know, all this intervention by governments, uh, not all of them are as uh, rich and uh, well positioned like Switzerland uh, will uh, have uh, uh, consequences. The amount of liquidity put by central banks, uh, uh, you know, uh, and the disruption that we are seeing right now in the supply chain of many um, uh, part of the industries will almost likely uh, mean that we will see again inflation. I think this is something that everybody is playing down right now, but you know. You, you just need to look at uh, the prices of energy and many other goods. So it's just a matter of time until we will see uh, inflation coming back. And this amount of debt, of course, is not necessarily, I'm sorry, a good news for all of you that are rather younger, because one day or the other, we need to repay that debt. So, I mean, this is definitely something that uh, um, uh, uh, easy to uh, uh, address. So let's face it, you know, the pandemic is not just an health issue, has created also a new, a new condition and has accelerated existing one. But, you know, all of that sounds negative again, but there is a good news because when you have those kind of changes, inevitably, you will see discontinuity. You will see a lot of opportunities that will bring us back into normality but I would say this will be a new normality, and a normality in which uh, uh, new ideas and uh, also uh, uh, the fact that uh, the acceleration that we are seeing right now in the digital space will continue to go through very fast. It creates a lot of opportunity, uh, um, uh, especially for all of you, because one advantage you have, not to be underestimated, is that you are young and uh, you are learning in a different and more flexible way how to go through that. So in that sense, uh, going through the COVID experience for you is just the beginning of a journey. I can tell you that in my career, I went through nine crises, nine crises, and COVID was only the last one. It started with a in the late 70s, early um, 80s with the Latin American debt crisis. 
I went through uh, the biggest crash of the stock market in uh, October 87, two, uh, two weeks after starting with a new employer. Uh, then we come the recession of the early 90s, the Asian financial crisis in 97. In 98, we had the Russian financial crisis, followed by Argentina and Brazil for three years, basically uh, dislocating financial markets. 2000, 2002, the first uh, big TMT bubble, the dot-com bubble. Some of you may have heard about that. It was a huge uh, change. I mean, act actually, it's a good example on how, you know, the vision about internet changing everything was exaggerated in the financial markets. So the financial markets were anticipating things could come too quickly, but eventually underestimated how profound they were. So, but you know, it was a crash. It was a huge dislocation in, uh, in the economies and in, in the business. And then uh, many of you may have heard of, uh, not many uh, may have gone through the financial crisis of 2007, 2008 and the last one which, as I said, most likely won't be the first one you personally go through. But, you know, those kind of crises, believe me, are huge, huge opportunities uh, to uh, uh, do something positive. Of course, they can destroy careers and businesses, but eventually it's always a great opportunity for somebody that thinks in different way or is willing to... Uh, uh, learn uh, the, the essential uh, outcome of those crises in a positive uh, way. So, uh, in essence, uh, think about this last uh, few months that you went through and what you had to adapt to as a part of your education process. You won't realize it now, but I'm sure you will realize that later on. So now, one of the topics uh, I thought I would talk about is uh, career and, uh, and, and leadership, since the title of the conference was somehow uh, putting that one and, uh, as, as a uh, line of, uh, of potential uh, um, you know, path on how you go from being an apprentice uh, to become a CEO of uh, the largest bank in Switzerland. So first of all, uh, many people ask me if I aspired to be a CEO when I started my career. And, uh, you know, this is usually a question that, you know, everybody gets. Let me tell you that personally speaking, you know, I don't think that you can plan this kind of careers. And actually, when you are 15 or 18, if you think you're going to become CEO of a bank, something's wrong with you, I would say. As, uh, you know, I was dreaming of being something else other than a CEO of a bank. But of course, you know, as time goes by and... Eventually for me, until I was offered that position, I never really believed I would be one because I went through in my career a lot of ups and downs. So there is no straight line that goes from apprentice to CEO of a bank. It can be very bumpy, very bumpy, and not always nice. And uh, also because, you know, we, when you, uh, you know, one first advice is to say that also, when you go through a, a pre-planning that goes so long, and, and your aspirations are so high, one mistake you, you can do, and I saw a lot of my colleagues doing that kind of mistakes, life can be very frustrating. So, because you may still achieve to have a great career, having done something you should be proud of, and still you are not able to make it to the last job. Doesn't mean that you were not good, does it mean that your career was bad? Not at all. So let events take you where you go. And most importantly, you need to like what you do. You can't just go for your entire life thinking about a career without liking what you're doing. If you don't like what you're doing and you're not passionate about what you do, it's very, very unlikely you will make a career that is truly sustainable, by the way. So, uh, when uh, uh, one advantage that, as I mentioned before, you, you have, or I guess the vast majority of you here in the room have, is that you're young and you can take risks. So, in order to advance and do experiences, you have to also be willing 
to put certain certainties at risk in respect of uh, uh, you know, uh, being, uh, um, being able to do a career and or uh, doing the job you like to do in a better way. It means you know, uh, going out of your comfort zone, moving out of uh, Geneva here or Switzerland uh, if necessary and some things get offered to you and leave some of your personal and professional interests or, or achievements behind you just in order to get uh, challenged. At the beginning of my career, as I mentioned, uh, Professor Barancini already mentioned, that's, uh, I, I started with a totally different approach. I went into banking only because it was the most convenient things to do in order to gap into Macaulay. Uh, the school of sports. So, and then after six months, or even not even six months, I realized I wanted to be a trader, a stock exchange or a, a foreign exchange trader. And I did, you know, in that sense, I did everything from that moment to get there. So, to the point that, you know, when I was offered, uh, I was 25, I was probably, the, uh, I was the youngest uh, uh, first level officer of the bank ever. So, and when I resigned uh, to, to my boss, they, they, he, he, he was very comprehensive and actually at the end of the day, he told me, you should go. But he also told me, if you stay, you're gonna have a pretty accelerated path into a couple of promotions in the next two or three years. But eventually, I wanted to be a trader. I wanted to be to doing a different thing in my life. I wanted to take uh, uh, that opportunity that was offered to me in order to grow and going out of my comfort zone. So that was only an example. One of the examples, I had also in my career plenty of opportunities to move for a little bit more money here and there or a little bit of a promotion, but I was happy about my job. So that's also one element you need to remember. Think about the opportunities, but also think about what you have. And be very, and don't let small things like a little bit of money or a little bit of a short-term promotion to also drive you too much into, in, into, into making the choices that uh, can be, uh, uh, can be, uh, can be uh, uh, wrong in, in a long-term uh, uh, respect. <laughs> so that, a little bit my experiences now, here is the right place to talk about the education uh, process. I think that uh, the journey, uh, uh, this itinerary we are talking about uh, is really kind of a Swissness uh, uh, approach to education. And I think that you know, we have to recognize that here in Switzerland, we are very lucky that people like me, that was not particularly a good student when I was 15, uh, but still had an ambitions. Uh, uh, we are all able to uh, pursue a different approach on how to grow into uh, into our our academic uh, and educational uh, uh, um, uh, process. So, of course, it goes without saying, the, almost the vast majority of you here shares the same background. So, I don't need to explain you the, the advantages. Uh, I think that uh, one can only say that. Uh, it's quite interesting to see that despite the success of Switzerland and uh, with this uh, vocational education system, um, Switzerland, Germany, and Austria, maybe we can add, uh, to, to be fair, it's quite interesting to see that no other countries has embraced the system. And the benefits are, are, are quite clear because at the end of the day, if you look at uh, what it means for the prosperity uh, of Switzerland, not only the, the economic one, but also the social prosperity, uh, compared to you know the rest of the world. I don't need, we don't need to go too far to discover that, for example, in Spain in June, the rate of uh, unemployment uh, at uh, youth uh, level was a staggering 36 percent for men and 39 percent for women. The average of the EU at 17%, so people at your age have those kind of unemployment. In Switzerland, is 3.2%. So you wonder why this system is not embraced more by other countries. I know the US is trying to do that, uh, and other countries are also trying to do that, but definitely they don't understand that it takes uh, you know, a very top-down planning uh, from uh, a federal level together with a solid framework that like we have in Switzerland to work together with cantons and, and, and go through also some aspects of uh, uh, cultural differences that you always uh, face. Um, 
So therefore, you know, one of the issues that clearly I can say it right now, maybe some of you are aware that there are ongoing discussions in Switzerland about reviewing uh, uh, you know, the education uh, framework for the commercial apprenticeships, which I think that, of course, we need to always look at ways to improve our system, but one has to pay attention not to go too far and trying to create a big change or a paradigm shift that would put at risk as a very successful uh, system. Now, staying on education, uh, no matter which basic education you choose, uh, one thing is crystal clear. You, it's just a path, it's just the beginning. You know, you may not uh, necessarily like it today, but it's a reality. Uh, so uh, it's, it's correct to say that, uh, uh, you know, ed constant education is the essential way to stay competitive as an individual. Of course, governments have to put the right uh, framework in place to make sure that education is embedded into uh, the system. Of course, employers, they need to do a lot in terms of uh, offering ongoing education and constant learning in the organization. But most importantly is you. If you don't invest time on yourself, it's very difficult to then have an ambition that goes beyond average. So you need to realize that. And you cannot expect or outsource your education to governments or just the employer. So it's a very important issue. So including myself, when I talk about education, I'm not talking about you as a uh, younger generation. I'm talking about myself and any other generation as we speak. I have to go through myself in training on how to understand the financial uh, and uh, risk uh, associated with running an, a reinsurer, which are different than the one I'm used to, to go through. So, but, you know, it's not, it's not something that you can escape. So the good news is that you show by the fact that you are here today and you are attending at this uh, school uh, uh, that you know that you need to do more than just having done a successful apprenticeship or anything else. So, but it's not over. Remember that. So, maybe let me move into the challenges ahead for, uh, and, and the opportunities uh, for tomorrow. Uh, I think that one of the most important issues that we have as a society is uh, the fact that we need to work in uh, respect of uh, resolving some potential conflict that we have between intergenerational, um, 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 intergenerations. In that sense, uh, uh, you know, I'm fully aware that my generation was able to build on uh, the great achievements of our fathers and grandfathers, and uh, and and essentially here in Europe, uh, in the U.S. and northern part of the hemisphere, we were lucky that we could really go through. Uh, decades of growth and prosperity across the board and, uh, and also personal freedom to do and say whatever we want. Uh, so uh, in that sense, uh, uh, you know, I think that is very important that we uh, uh, take seriously uh, in my generation, but also you as a new uh, generation and every generation, uh, the fact that we need to develop this and making sure that the future is as rosy as the one we had. Now, in order to do that, you need to have a solid and sustainable economic uh, framework. You know, you don't create uh, well-being for everybody if you don't have a solid economic prosperity. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, it's very important that some of the challenges I'm going to talk about right now, uh, like climate, like uh, uh, pension fund uh, um, uh, system, uh, the social system um, uh, uh, part of the equation, uh, needs to take uh, uh, a serious look at. And your, you, as a young generation, needs to be on the, on the driving seat of that. On climate change, I think that of course, is in everybody's mind because you look also what happened in, during the summer uh, in Europe and, and generally speaking, we saw things that, of course, they used to happen in the past as well, but the frequency 
of those events is now going up to a level that you know you can definitely see a discontinuity between history and, and today. So uh, uh, the inter intergovernmental panel of, on climate change is just confirming those uh, those data and uh, and the frequency. Uh, as a Swiss re chairman, I can tell you that this is a big part of our job. And actually, this part of the year is the most volatile because all the natural catastrophes that we see in, uh, in North America and, uh, is, is at the peak. And, uh, and we see also there a change in path and, uh, in, uh, that is uh, quite, uh, quite uh, uh, alarming. So uh, when you talk about CO, uh, CO2 uh, reductions, uh, you all know that uh, uh, today we emit around 30 billion tons of CO2 and uh, the plan is going down to zero uh, in the foreseeable future. So in order to do that, we need to develop new technologies. We need to rethink about how we consume energy. And, uh, uh, and this is going to make... Uh, uh, you know, drive a lot of changes, the one that I referred at the beginning. So all those changes are for you opportunities because the business, as we have been running it in the last 10, 20, 30 years, will need to be reshaped and new opportunities will come not only on how we run the existing businesses, but, you know, most importantly also in the way, uh, you know, new, new, new technology will open up new uh, um, uh, business uh, uh, segments. The second topic that I think is important to talk about is uh, uh, the high importance to your generation in the, in, in the pension uh, uh, and your involvement in, in the pension reforms. Some things that I'm sure you don't think about because if you are so young, you don't think about your pension. But believe me, it's something that you should get very serious about learning and, and understanding how you can contribute to resolve uh, the matter. Now, if you leave it for my generation and the older one, or even the one just before mine, you should know that we are likely to be more and more of us as a percentage of the overall population. So not necessarily the right uh, framework. And you know, although, as I mentioned before, we need to find ways to work together between generations, you need to take the lead. And, and let me tell you why. The current pension system is financially unsustainable. And this is not an opinion. You can look at numbers, look at the forecast into the next 30, 40 years in terms of uh, the balance of demographics, and you will see that financially the pensions system and the social system as we have it today is not, uh, uh, is not sustainable. And this, in my point of view, can lead into huge conflict. Uh, let me tell you a couple of numbers to start with. In Switzerland today, uh, the proportion of the population aged 65 or older is 19%. In 2050, it will be 25%. In 2060, so when you are probably at, in the middle of your, or at the peak of your uh, uh, career in terms of uh, earning power, uh, it will be uh, 6.5 people being pensioners versus 10 people working. Okay, so you see a conflict developing here. You see that if you keep the system as it is right now, you won't be able to resolve the issue. And in my point of view, it's quite irresponsible, politically speaking, to keep delaying addressing this issue and or trying to pretend that this is an issue that you easily resolve by increasing taxes because eventually that will make the overall system less competitive. So recently, I have to say, I'm very happy to see that uh, uh, the younger generation is taking a lead into that subject. Uh, the young liberals in Switzerland have successfully launched uh, this in initiative uh, Pour les Rentes. I don't know if this is exactly the right solution. It doesn't matter. The most important issue is to open a debate. And as I, said, as I said, very good example on how the young generation take leadership on a very, very important topic. So we need a solution on that one. And uh, 
I'm sure we can find a solution that is not necessarily bad for the older generation and it's definitely a good news for the young one. Now, uh, my third topic is digitalization. Uh, I mentioned before Altis will uh, really reshape the labor market. So I'd like to start with the bad news. The bad news is that according to the World Economic Forum, uh, 85 million jobs will disappear between now and 2025 due to corona and the developments and implementation of new technologies. Not great. The good news, 97 million jobs will be created in the same time. And again, you can see also the good part of the equation for all of you because, of course, you know, the ones that are likely to go through a tough time are my generation, so the uh, baby boomers, or now soon also very impacted is Generation X that uh, uh, will, uh, will have to go through a lot of changes and, 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 and challenges in, in, in mastering that transformation. But for you, that you are just at the beginning of your process of learning and um, uh, new skills and where digital is at the center of everything you do, both in your social life but also in your professional life, you have gained, hopefully, that skill set together with the flexibility that is necessary to be competitive and to be the one filling the 97 million jobs. So great news for you. Uh, again, you can see how COVID developments has brought into an acceleration of a trend that may be uh, very, very good for you. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, your job and your flexibility is also very necessary to be uh, uh, fostered and to be maintained in, in the next years because most likely you will change few jobs in your career because those constant changes in the labor market are likely to be a feature that we will see more and more coming uh, in the years and decades to come. So in terms of uh, embracing digital changes, I have to say, just briefly for Switzerland, we are not really where we should be. You know, in some areas we are at the top uh, in the academic world, in education, in certain elements of uh, innovation, we, we are at the top and we are losing a little bit of ground. But when I go down into the digital space, I have to say that uh, the combination of uh, uh, lack of penetration of digital capabilities in, uh, in, in, in the governments, in the way you know, the, the administration of governments works in the way we vote, in the way we contribute to democracy is not as advanced as it should be. And there is also a clear resistance on, uh, on, on that aspect. For example, you remember that uh, at the beginning of the, this year, the Swiss population turned down the vote on the uh, EID uh, um, um, Identité uh, Electronique, uh, the EID, and uh, which was a clear sign of reluctance to let uh, 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 the digital world come being part of our, our, uh, uh, our um, um, model and our society. If you look at uh, Switzerland, very good news. We have wonderful roads and railroads, I mean, at, at least compared to many countries uh, around us and in the world. But when you, when you look down at uh, uh, technologies, and 5G is a good example, we still are debating about introducing the minimum level of 5G. I'm not saying about the, the advanced one, the one that is almost clear that has no real repercussion on health. And if we do that, instead of having wonderful roads uh, in respect of the future, we're going to be driving on back roads uh, in respect of our digital capabilities. Uh, Embracing blockchain is starting here in Switzerland, but uh, it's very, very important, not only for the financial system, but also for the entire, uh, um, in the, um, for the entire economy. And uh, last but not least, I'd like to talk about one negative aspect of uh, the digital uh, developments are the cyber risks associated with, uh, and, but also there I see a lot of opportunities for us in Switzerland, not necessarily just on the technology front, but is a combination of technology and brand. Uh, Switzerland is seen worldwide as a secure place. So if we develop a clear strategy around data for our country, but also for the rest of the world, we have a great chance 
to become what banks and, and, and other financial institutions used to be in Switzerland in terms of safety and reliability about confidentiality and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and um, uh, security. So uh, in that sense, a great opportunity. So I'm coming to a close. And uh, so in that sense, after hearing me, you, you can see how uh, planning a career in this environment in details is not the smartest move you could do. I think that you need to know directionally where you want to go. Uh, too many has nothing to do with you. It's too many external factors. So you need to stay agile. You need to uh, be a self-confidence that the future belongs to you, but also uh, um, and uh, you need to be able to balance your professional and, uh, and personal uh, life, and most importantly, think about how you can contribute uh, to society. I think that's uh, one advice I can tell you, as, you, as I mentioned in my own experience, but also going forward, don't jump on the easy path to success or what you perceive to be success. And particularly, don't rely on easy promises, particularly when they come from governments. There is no easy path, no easy path. And uh, so take control of your ambitions and, uh, and make sure that uh, to the extent that you believe that, that uh, governments should provide the right framework for the society and also make sure that there is a healthy and com competitive environment in our economies. And last but not least, as I said before, stay flexible. And, uh, but remember that it's not just about uh, being flexible. Uh, be willing to invest on yourselves, your capabilities. And the notion of capabilities, and it's very important, has to be extended now and over time from the academic element to the emotional element. You won't be able to be a leader, a good colleague, or whatever, if you don't have emotional IQ, the emotional Q, the EQ element. This is as important, if not more important, than the IQ. The IQ, I saw a lot of smart people in my career failing because they had zero or negative EQ. And it's something that you really need to be aware of. So, in closing, I wish you all the best for your professional, academic development, for your, and most importantly, for your personal life. Thanks.